Hello there guys, welcome back to Upper Reach's uh, live stream virtual tasting. Um, today we're in a completely different spot because I thought we'd do something extra special today and we're going to taste one of the wines that has, is still maturing in its barrels. So today is going to be all about Shiraz. We're going to have a great little surprise guest later on, so please stay tuned for that. Um, she's going to help me very much with the tasting side of things. So. Let's hope that you're ready to learn a lot about Shiraz. So as always, I'm going to be splitting this into three parts. Um, I'll start off with a bit of a background about um, pretty much, yeah, pretty much where Shiraz comes from, how it's become one of the quintessential Swan Valley red varietals, and also just what makes it so distinctive, and is it as great in other countries as well. So that'll be a really fun chat. We'll then move on to an amazing tasting where we'll be dipping our little wine thief into 2020's Reserve Shiraz. You're not going to see this for another six years, and we're going to have our first look at it right today. Um, we're then going to go on to the 2016 Reserve Shiraz, our beautiful current release, a great award winner, um, does very well in competitions, and then also our museum release 2009, which is our, actually our most awarded Shiraz. So, without further ado, and once again, thank you so much for like joining me today, guys. I do really appreciate it, and hopefully we'll have some fun. Um, so to start off with, I mean, Shiraz actually has quite a disputed history. It, like, its origins are quite argued, uh, like, around the world. And it's, it's quite interesting because there is a place in Iran which is called Shiraz. And it used to be a wine-growing region. So everybody made the connection, okay, Shiraz must come from that region. And it must have gone to France from there. But what we've actually discovered and doing a bit of research into this is that is not the case. Uh, Shiraz, or as it's otherwise known, Syrah, is a French varietal, which actually was first established in the Rhone region of France. So it's a great little thing just to, like, wow, myth busted, that kind of thing. So um, with the, like, back well, about 300 years ago, I think it was, Iran was actually quite a thriving wine region. They used to create beautiful white wines, which were like really well received by everyone who they exported to. Um, but then uh, the prohibition came in and all of the wineries just shut up shop. So it's an absolute shame, but yeah, what can we do? Now we have our normal Shiraz. Another fun little fact, Syrah, so the name of Shir the alternative name of Shiraz actually means princess in Arabic. So we've got a couple of little fun facts there and everything. So um, going back onto really the French style of Syrah. Now this really came from and was popularized down in the southern Rhone region where it was often blended with Grenache and Mouvedre um, and those kind of real they kind of change what the wine was all about. So it, generally those blends are going to be more Grenache predominant, um, and then the Shiraz is there to add a bit of body and a bit of complexity. Um, but yeah, it's a really great little blend. I do urge everybody to give some uh, Grenache Shiraz Mouvedres a little go. Um, but going back to France, it's had a wonderful history, and the style that they make there is very clean. It's very sort of like mineral and quite flinty and black pepper um, in its character, um, whereas a lot of the New World styles of Shiraz um, have become very big, meaty, full-bodied and bold. Um, and that really came across from our wonderful little home, Australia. And basically, like, what, well, Shiraz first came across to Australia in the late 1700s. And when it came across at that time, Pretty much everyone was just experimenting with it. It really thrived in our Mediterranean climate. Generally, Shiraz has quite a, a good threshold for what it can withstand temperature and climate-wise. So it's a great little thing to be, yeah, like delving into really. And obviously, when people think of Australian Shiraz, they think of the Barossa Valley, they think of McLaren Vale, um, and all of these amazing regions over east that have made Shiraz 
the quintessential Australian red that it is. But over in here in WA, we were very quick to catch on. It was not long before Shiraz was planted due to the popularity of it over, like with Penfolds, with Henchke, with uh, Tabalk, um, and pretty much it really, it really caused a bit of a stir here as well because the main like varietals over here at the time were being made to use fortified wine. So when we were able to make those great little red table wines, it was a big stepping stone as well. Um, and here in Western Australia as well, we've actually got such a diverse, like such different and diverse areas to grow Shiraz in. And because it really is impressionable upon its climate and its weather. Um, so you've got up here in the Swan Valley, which has a very warm Mediterranean climate, and you then also have Shiraz grown down in the Great Southern. And that is much cooler climate. So if you put those two wines next to each other, you are not going to, you're gonna see a stark difference between the two. So if you don't believe me, give it a go. I urge you to because, what do, well, it's isolation time. Let's have some fun and drink some wine and discover a little bit more about it, shall we? Um, now, up here in the Swan Valley in particular, um, Shiraz and Grenache are some of our quintessential red varietals. Now, our Grenaches are generally, as I mentioned in the previous live stream, quite a more summery style of red wine up here in the valley. Um, they can be made with carbonic maceration and Really, they allow them to be a lot more summery and bright, um, and pretty much they kind of stay quite far apart from each other here. Now, we used to do a Shiraz and Grenache blend, and that was super popular. You guys will remember it as the Gig, um, and now we're onto the Gig Grenache. So, who knows, we might incorporate some more Shiraz into the Gig in the future, and we'll hope, yeah, that it'll be quite a fun little. Yeah, quite a fun little thing to give a try of, really. Um, going back to different kinds of blends and styles of Shiraz as well, um, there's one that really catches people's eye, and that is Shiraz Viognier. Now, this is insane. So you're, com you're actually co-fermenting a red wine and a white wine. Like, you'd assume that that would do something very, very strange, but it's actually something amazing because when you have the white and the red grapes in that sort of 95% red, 5% white ratio, you're actually able to get something called co-pigmentation. So if you were to pick up a Shiraz, just a straight Shiraz from one vineyard and a Shiraz Viognier from, a, from the same vineyard and look at the color, the Shiraz Viognier is going to be a lot deeper, darker, and more purple in its hue. It's a really cool little thing, and it adds to the aromatics of the wine as well. Um, there are some amazing ones around Western Australia at the moment, and I urge you to give them a go. There are, there's one amazing one at Millbrook Winery, for instance. I urge you to try that because it is delicious. Um, now, what we're going to really be kind of discussing about Shiraz that we make here, um, like a lot, of, a lot of the time, Shiraz, when it's grown in a very nice, warm Mediterranean climate, it really thrives. And because of our unique climate up here in the Swan Valley, um, we're actually, we, because we have such hot um, daytimes and summers and very cool, um, very cool winters and nights, that diurnal range that you get with that climate actually really, really builds up on the Shiraz. It's a great little way of growing it. And you'll find some amazing exp expressions of Shiraz up here in the Swan Valley. Um, up here, you're going to get very big, rich, bold styles of Shiraz with lots of dark fruits, plum, um, sort of black currant, but like quite concentrated, um, really like, what's the word, like baked fruits, but not in a sort of stewed, like very high sugar kind of way, like very nice, like roasted. And it's just like, you can tell a warm climate Shiraz from a mile away. And honestly, if you like those big, bold, hearty flavors and you like those big, bold, hearty meals, you can't go wrong with it. Um, when we're going, when we're talking more about a cooler climate Shiraz, um, 
we're going to be getting more herbaceous characters. We're going to also be getting a little bit more of a kind of stone, like a, like a minerality to it as well. Um, also like quite a, quite a stark pepper character to it as well. So you're not going to get quite as much of that meaty note, but you're definitely going to get that cleanness, that just, oh, that really, really yummy little drop. Um, now, I'm loving these questions as well. I cannot wait to go through them at the end. Now, unfortunately, with my new setup, I'm going to have to walk around the barrels and come to you to read through them, but we will do that after our tasting. Um, now, while we, um, yeah, pretty much what we're going to be really starting off with is our 2020 Shiraz. Now, like, I was lucky enough to help out with this vintage and be there to, like, collect the grapes and be there to crush. And also, this is, um, this is one of the tanks that I jumped into to clean out. And I tell you, a lot of hard work and dedication goes into these wines. Um, it is amazing. Now, the great thing with this year's vintage, we had that beautiful diurnal um, kind of weather pattern where it was sort of very hot, very cold, very hot, very cold. And that really allowed a lot of character to be built in the fruit, so it had a very long ripening time. Um, it's a great method just to concentrate your fruit. And the place that Laura and Derek actually grew their Shiraz has its own little microclimate, which I just think is astounding to have found such a little gem. And like when Laura and Derek first purchased the property in 1996, um, all, of the, all of the vineyard you know um, with Upper Reach that has so many different varietals on it now, they plant, they ripped it up down in that flood gully and they planted the Shiraz by hand. So this was actually their first red like out of 100% Chardonnay back here. This was their first red, this, well, they actually did get some fruit from, I think it was the Franklin River. Um, they got some Cabernet fruit to try out making a red, but this one, they planted themselves, they waited, they were patient, and they put their hearts into making this Shiraz in this really unique climate. Now, as for, yeah, I have a nice, Nice little surprise. So we're going to do the, the tasting of our 2020 together. So Fantastic, it's lovely to be here. Um, in Perth, they've relaxed some of the conditions, so we're allowed to have the both of us here now together. So I'm very excited to be a part of it. Yeah, so like, when, I've just been telling the guys out here that like, when you first established all of the Shiraz vines, like this was actually the first red that you planted out of all of the Chardonnay that you first had here, right? Yeah, when we bought the property, it was all planted to Chardonnay. Um, it was fairly run down, so that first year we were really sort of um, focusing on um, just getting the crop in and sorting it out. But after a year or two, we uh, wanted to make some red wine. Um, so that's what we started by, was planting some Shiraz uh, grapes. Little rootlings, the way you plant um, vines is we, yeah, that's right. We went and got cuttings from a friend's vineyard. Um, so that's during pruning, so in the winter. Then we um, made them into rootlings. So you actually cover them up in sand down the bottom. And what will happen is those little nodes, you know, like the little buds on the um, vines, they'll turn into little roots. So you dig them up, uh, come back October, and we actually uh, experimented with a number of different ways of actually planting these rootlings. So you've got to get the, they've got little sort of white sort of sticky roots sort of coming out from them. So you sort of dig a hole, a very small hole, um, and then you put them in and you pack the earth around them. But we're not planting one or two, we were planting, oh gosh, I should have checked really, shouldn't I? I can't remember how many, like, let's go 500 or 1,000. Um, so then we started actually trialing, it was a bit slow doing it that way, it was very slow doing it that way. And then we started trialing, um, uh, doing it with like a water, spear so actually trying to make a small hole using the coarse oh. water um, and then we put the rootlings in and then you could just sort of pack it around it um, so that was fairly uh, fun I mean we were pretty naive <laughs> um, but you know there was all these different ways of doing it so that first couple of years uh, obviously well not obviously but unfortunately not all of them grew um, so it was fairly patchy then after that, once you've got them growing, really those first couple of years, you keep actually basically cutting all the growth off in winter so that they go down because you really want them to focus on 
building a big root system yeah. rather than um, um, making leaves and things because uh, you want them to survive. So it, about after the first couple of years, we've just basically cut it all back down, each pruning, just back down to two buds that we're showing so that all the energy went into the roots. And then after the uh, first couple of years, then you would train up two tendrils. Hopefully you get two, uh, what would you call them? Stems really, but they're very soft uh, green ones growing up from those two buds. And then you would start to um, start to train them into that sort of, I guess, T shape that we use yeah. for um, uh, Amazing. growing vines. So like how long from when you planted those cuttings to actually getting the first fruit? Well, of it felt like a very long time. <laughs> um, as I say, really three, four, probably five years before you get um, a crop that you can use. I think uh, in the first couple of years, we just would cut the fruit off uh, because we really were still trying to establish the vines. So if you imagine at the time, quite a bit younger, um, it was about 98, I think. Um, yeah, 98, 99. Um, and we had any income, okay? So we bought this property and we're farming it and we're growing the grapes, we had no income. So you, keeping cutting these vines back to try and get some fruit off them and then they put, get some fruit out and then you cut that fruit off and you chuck it on the ground and then you you know finally after five years you can actually start to um, pick some fruit and, and and make a bit of wine i mean what we had done was we would buy i think um we bought some shiraz in so we could add the stuff that we bought to what we had just so that we had something we could make some red wine and sell it um, but yeah, it was pretty exciting that first year when it was all upper reach Shiraz. Oh, what was it like when you like first had that Shiraz that you made yourself? You planted it five, six years ago <laughs> and you first tasted it. Well, I don't know that I could say what exactly it was like because you've got to remember, I, even then I was involved in making it as well. <laughs> so, you know, I was tasting all the way through from grapes, through to juice, through the ferment, all of that sorts of things. So, um, you know, it tasted good. Tasted like wine, <laughs> but that was good. <laughs> um, no expectations, then you can overachieve. Um, but I think once it was in bottles, I guess that's probably more what you're asking. Yeah. I felt that was really exciting when it was in bottle. But to see that finished product, of course, then you've got to design a label. Um, yeah, it was a fair lot of things to do. Um, and in fact, what we did, it was so stupid. It was only that first. Oh no, we never did it with Shiraz. Our first red that we actually made was a Cabernet Sauvignon and we brought that fruit in. But what we did was we bottled it but unlabeled. So then I used to get these great big um, pallets of, of filled wine, which was um, uh, sealed with a cork in those days. And I, <laughs> I hand labeled every bottle. <laughs> it was absolutely crazy. We ended that for one year. <laughs> um, yeah, that's right. But you know, wow. we just didn't have enough money to pay the bottlers yeah. to put the labels on. So we had to do it by hand. So yeah, I guess those are kind of the memories that, that, yeah. are, that leap out of my head when I sort of think about those sort of beginning wines. Um, was all the work. The other, I guess, moment that also um, I can remember, uh, and don't ask me which wine it is now, so I can remember. <laughs> I think it might have been 2000, but you know, getting that first medal yeah. for a Shiraz was just like, just oh my God, medals. that is so exciting. <laughs> so that was just like, oh wow. And then, you know, and then like the next year getting a medal again, yeah, it wasn't just a one-off wonder. Um, so that was pretty exciting. And I remember saying to Jack, oh, lucky you can make wine. <laughs> that wasn't a given, that was a surprise. So um, yeah, no, it was, it was pretty exciting. And then you sort of got on that, I wouldn't say got on a trajectory, because still, you know, I think uh, we're tasting 09 today. Um, I remember we did really well with our 2003. Sorry, that is all sold out. Um, you can't have any. Um, we did very well with the 2003, and that was one of those really pivotal moments where we thought, oh, this actually might work. Wow. <laughs> uh, you know, it was only, what, four, five, six, seven years after we bought the property, so. Um, that's what they always say about wineries, though, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah way to make a small fortune in a winery is to start with a large one. Not that we did that either, but um, yeah, you know I, I, I wouldn't do it again. <laughs> Not like that. That's true. You know what I should have done? I should have gotten the, um, I should have gotten the first Shiraz. What I'll do, I'll post a picture of the first actual bottle of Shiraz that they made. I think it's a 2003, isn't it? No, we definitely made Shiraz in 2001. Uh, There's to be one confirmed. in the stable, and I will, I will post this up in the comments below so you guys can actually see the first label that we had here. Um, well, I reckon we get on to tasting these great little wines. Yeah, so fantastic. I think, this is exciting, I'm going to make a hell of a mess, I do apologise. Yeah, I'm not sure you've got enough glasses. 
No, I don't, do I? No, I'll go and get two more, that's all right. Thank Bear you. With me. <laughs> Bear with us, technical issue. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Look at this. That looks astounding. Can you see that? Check that out. Look at the colour of that. Yeah, let's get another one of these so I can close it up so Derek won't kill me. <laughs> Here we are. Alrighty, let's get some of this. There we go, that's all I'm going to need, isn't it? One. Let me just pop this to one side over here. Fantastic. So next week's live stream is going to be a nice little Mother's Day theme. So we're going to be doing everything bubbly. So we're going to be talking about sparkling. We're going to be really just going through all of the things that we love the most about bubbles and mums. So that'll be really good fun for us all. Do hope that you guys can join in and be there. Let me just wait for a few more of these to come out. Here we go. You might be wondering, I'm going to like lose track of which wine is which, but I can assure you, I am not. So, you can tell with the colour, first of all, look at that to begin with. Really rich, dark, concentrated, do you see how it kind of clings to the glass? Um, and then this one, a lot more ruby and purple in its colour when you swirl it. Sorry, I would do a lot better with um, looking at colour um, if I had a nice little white background, so I'm just using my shirt. So, and then we have the 2009, and you can kind of see how that's getting a nice little, like, orange garnet kind of hue to it. All right, I have your lovely drops there for you. <laughs> I couldn't you. find the same size glasses. Sorry about that. You wouldn't I'm know that I'm wrapped. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, so good. you have... I've got a blind tasting. Pretty much, yeah. Oh, that's what I should do. <laughs> so that is straight out the barrel. Yep. Um, and you can really tell that just from that colour and the way it's coating the, um, the glass. I think, it, you know, even I could have told if it was... You mess, mix them up. I think I have. Yeah. Well, that's now a blind tasting. <laughs> okay. What do you think of the first part? Oh, wow. I haven't actually had this Shiraz yet from the, um, the barrel. And it's... What year is it, Steve? 2020. This is this year. Yeah, year's right. So it's only barrel. just um, been crushed and fermented. So it's just um, he's been fermenting actually, and Derek's been testing this quite a lot. Um, I know because I have to pay the bills, um, <laughs> but to make sure that it's fermented to completely dry, because uh, sometimes you can get what's called a stuck ferment, um, and that's when uh, not all the sugar uh, reacts with the yeast to um, turn to alcohol. Uh, and what we don't really want is a sweet Shiraz. Um, and it's been interesting, we've had a few problems in the last couple of years with stuck ferments and Derek's going, oh, uh, I never really wanted to be able to say this, but I'm actually getting really good at restarting ferments now. <laughs> <laughs> Which wasn't something that he set out to do, he really just wanted to go smoothly and no problems. But um, yeah, it's just really interesting, the last about three or four years we've had a, a thing with stuck ferments. But we managed to get over it, he's restarted the ferment was the Easter weekend um, and they have actually all gone through so they are all dry so that's always good news but what a fantastic nose it's really chocolatey. And I was showing the guys the colour as well like if when you swirl it it just clings to the glass. Yeah absolutely really stunning. viscous. I mean I think what I'm getting most in the nose is probably that lovely chocolatey oak. Yeah. Um, I'm a bit of a sucker for that Definitely. and it's something I think that Derek Shiraz is are known for is his use yeah. of um, this beautiful really? um, oak. It's mercury oak barrels for you know the nerds amongst us. <laughs> um, and that's one of the things that the winemaker has to do is go through around about September, he gets together with his winemaker mates and they go and uh, it sounds weird, sniff barrels. Um, they'll all go get together, they'll have a look at the smell of each other's barrels, but they'll also bring a wine, a white wine that's been aged in barrel, so that they can, and they're not trying to taste the wine, they're trying to taste what the oak tastes like to work out which barrels they want to buy. Mm. Uh, and of course the barrel salesmen will yeah. often bring you samples of that. Yeah. So they are rather expensive at barrels, so you've got to get it right. <laughs> mm. And like there's so much fruit concentration in mm. this one as well. It's just dark cherries, that beautiful plum character, like really that's nice bright amazing. plums. That's God, I haven't had that. That's actually fantastic. It's not very critical, is it? <laughs> but um, that's a really big mouthful. That's going to be absolutely sensational. It's amazing. You can tell that they... Mm. You don't even need to spit. Mm. You're walking home. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've probably got all that 
shirt too. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I think mm. that's looking amazing. It's super full bodied as well, and you're getting like it's a young style of Shiraz, and you can see like in its youth, if it, you've got a lot of tannin, you've got a good acidity, and you've got real concentrated flavors there. That is going to be a wine that you can age for 10 plus, maybe even 15 plus years. So, and that's something you can do with this Shiraz, as a bunch of you out there have got at the moment. You've got the 2009, but let's do a little swap through. This is where you've got to figure out which one's oh, right, which. Okay. <laughs> well, if I'm half decent, I should be able to do it by the colour, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, I think I know what I think. Mm. <laughs> Holding up great, isn't it? Oh, you can get the nine now, not sixteen. No, the nine. But yeah. I mean, take smelling the two, you can actually like the similarities, the vintage consistency between the two, and like there's what's that? There's seven years of difference between the two, and on the nose, it's like the O nine still got some great fruit purity to it, and that oak is just. Yeah, I think that's yeah, the good 09, news. I was right. This is the 09. <laughs> Gee, I think what actually I always find with these when I do um, a vertical tasting, and no, that doesn't mean we stay vertical. Uh, <laughs> we, we do, but it's when you look at um, all those different years, same wine over different years. I'm always amazed by how it all seems to follow through. You know, they're very, very consistent style. Um, and it is that use probably of the same oak, but obviously, but also it's that little microclimate that we have down there in yeah. the vineyard in that area. And it is great. It's a couple of degrees cooler down in that point where the Shiraz has grown as well. And that just kind of mimics a cooler climate style of Shiraz as well. It just keeps everything really nice and well, vibrant. And I probably just, wouldn't say it mimics a cooler climate, but I think it's a unique little spot yeah. that we've got and that's what comes through in the Shiraz and I suppose my thinking was honed a bit by this yeah. um, in 2017 when we lost it all um, and when we had the floods and it all <laughs> we didn't have any and we bought in some really nice Shiraz from a friend's vineyard um, he does a beautiful job it's fantastic Shiraz uh, and I said oh why can't we make reserve Shiraz out of this you know this is great great fruit and he said oh yeah well, it, it is good fruit uh, and it has been made by other winemakers into very expensive wines he said but it, it won't taste the same as ours it hasn't got the really distinctive characteristics from that little bit of yeah. part of the vineyard it's not even the whole vineyard doesn't taste like that that part is the lowest point of the vineyard it's the gully so the, it, all the cool air like Stephen yeah. was saying sort of pulls down there um, so yeah I guess that's the first thing that really yeah. sets me up on wines like this well, let's carry on and think. We've got to mention food as well with these kind of Shirazes. I mean, there's mm. such bold flavours in these reds that you're going to need quite a nice bold meal with it as well. Like, I mean, like any of those very hearty stews we're talking, anything smoked or anything like barbecue as well, I would kind of go for. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking that autumn's coming. Uh, we we. Uh, in uh, the Swan Valley at the moment, it's probably the most beautiful day we've had for a long time. Maybe that's just because we can go out. Um, but um, I'm sort of starting to think sort of lamb shanks, slow roasted lamb, that sort of thing. Yeah. But I, yeah, that, that's the sort of food that I also like as well. Yeah. But yeah, you, you're really wanting to balance the intensity and the weight of the wine and the food together, yes. I think. Um, when you're doing um, food and wine matching, so any of those sort of hearty things, but like saying stews or even pies, is lovely. You know, when it really gets sure. cold. Yeah. It's true. Um, I would it's just true. like to have a quick chat about the 2016 as well, because yeah. that's probably what um, I imagine quite a few people have got in front of them. Um, that's our current release. Um, only relatively recently released, and it's funny. I was just at Silla Door today, and someone said, "Oh, I can't believe you've got any of the 2016 left." And I was like, "Oh, it's only came out at Christmas." Um, and I think that that is an absolutely stunning um, Shiraz. Look, the 15 did very well, but I think I almost like the 16 yeah. more. Um, I just think it's so, um, it's got those lovely sort of rich, ripe, big, full fruit flavours, that factory yeah, black currant. Um, but it's so smooth. Um, I guess 2016, that, that's still four years old, but it, it doesn't look ridiculously young. Though, having said that, having just tried the 2020, which I know is not fair on you guys because yeah. you haven't, that <laughs> doesn't look very young either. So, um, yeah, they've got ages to go. And like, I think with the, the difference between the 15 and the 16, really, I think the, um, 
the oak, so that real sweet, soft tobacco kind of character to it, that soft vanillin tobacco is coming through beautifully with this, and it works really well with its floral notes because it's got quite a nice violet yeah. note to me, like yeah. for me anyway. But That's right. Like, and I guess you don't get that on the older one, that 2009. No. I don't think you get the floral. I think that's more of a young wine character. Um, uh, on the... Just, no, 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 that was the, that's the 2020, I was just trying to see whether that was floral, but I don't get the floralness on that yet, I think it's not developed yet, but, um, yeah, that, the older one is a lot more earthy, a lot richer, mm. still doesn't look particularly old, um, yeah, 2009, it's 11 years old, um, I don't think it's going to have any trouble going on until it's 15, that's for sure. Definitely not. Mm. And with these reds as well, you do notice as they age, so with white wines, as we saw last week with the Chardonnay, they gain colour over time, but with the red wines, they actually lose colour. So they become a little bit less full-bodied, they become a little bit more sort of transparent, but they, that red ruby kind of note, or the purple hue that you get commonly with Shiraz, that's going to turn more into a kind of garnet brick kind of colour, and you're just starting to get that that's with the... Yeah, with the 2009, yeah. and it's Which amazing that it's holding see, it so beautifully. Ah, there you go. I know go. this is in this before, but yeah, you can see it's a bit more of a bricky colour maybe. Yeah. So, it's yeah, a great little thing. thing. Just to, yeah, and Fantastic. they're just gorgeous little wines. And yeah, definitely with those heartier meals, I think with the older styles of Shiraz, um, keep it simple, you've got to enjoy those, just how a wine is developed as well. Like, I mean, what kind of things would you come up with for sort of an aged style of Shiraz? It's well, always quite complicated when you get those oh, aged. Like, well, I guess I'm with you really. Yeah. Like, I don't really overthink it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> feel like. yeah, um, but something that's really lovely with a, an older Shiraz would be venison because those Ooh, lovely um, sort of yes. game characters I think will go really nicely. That would be mm, mm, that's sort of what Venison's I guess leads to mind. Yeah. Yeah. I am going to have to figure out how to start our little question and answer. Do you want me so, to go around because you're on this side? Well, or what we could try and do... Just read them out. Yeah, if you want to try that. Remember the camera's on this side. Yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> this is going to be entertaining, This is the technical well challenge. <laughs> so I would probably start our... Oh, 2016 is well integrated. Well done. Fantastic. Thanks, Elizabeth. Really appreciate that. And oh. like, it's just... It's so soft, and the first thing that I like really got from it when I, well, when I first tried the Reserve Shiraz here was that sweet vanillin tobacco. It comes through so strong for me. Anybody who's done a wine appreciation class with me as well, like I bring out a vanilla infused cigar and you smell it and they are identical. So it is a really, it's amazing like flavor characteristics with those wines, yeah. Um, I've got oh, Daniel asking about how the vines survived from the 2017 flood. Wow. Um, in all honesty, vines are so resilient. They, like, I mean, nuclear apocalypse, we are talking cockroaches and we're talking Shiraz vines. They're going to be the things that are left. So we were very lucky in terms of the Shiraz. Um, there was, a, I can't remember the percentage loss. Not much. Like, we didn't actually lose a vine. vine. Um, yeah. What we did was we found one of their two, some of the arms died. Yes, uh, we did have to work right. really hard on them and make sure that they didn't, um, you know, to keep the crops down for the next few years afterwards. Uh, so this 2016 is the last year before that 2017 where there is none. <laughs> um, I've got here uh, from Tina, how does the taste of the wine change with each year's crop? Does the fruit from a young... Well, this is a great question. From a young vine, make wine that tastes different from that of a mature vine. Well, it's actually, that is a really great question. And I was like, in getting ready for doing this um, wine tasting with you guys, I watched quite a lot of things about Shiraz that was over from the Barossa Valley. He calls and this work? I call it work. It's market research. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the thing that I found, they, all of them will say, um, Old vines don't make a wine. A wine will make an old vine. And what they kind of mean by that is they will, like, they have old vines in the Barossa. We have old vines here in the Swan Valley. And we're not getting them because they're old. Like, we keep on taking great fruit off of these vines that have been around for 50, over 80 years. 
and they keep producing great quality. So why on earth would we get rid of them? So they actually start to really build the reputation there. But I, I think like what happens over time as well, when you've got older vines, their yields drop, but their quality apparently will improve as well. So I hope I've answered that one for you. Um, and what other questions did we have? Uh, the, the, I guess with older vines, I was going to say there's that quality quantity trade off, I guess, yeah, is, is really what Steve's talking about. And you end up having to make a decision uh, as to whether there, it's cost effective to continue to have those yes. vines, I suppose. Um, and with people, uh, you know, like you guys getting more into wine, then it, it is because then you start to look at, and in fact, the Swan Valley is actually looking at doing a register of old vines. Um, that's one of the oh, things really the Winemakers Association is doing. Um, uh, so that, this yeah, is great, we've got the leaves. insider knowledge here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's a lot of old vines in the Swan Valley, so they're trying to sort of do a, a log off them. Um, yes. Yeah, now I didn't read all the questions, but because I didn't say them straight away, of course I haven't really remembered them very well. <laughs> um, what were the gist of it? Yeah, about? that's right. So I think people are really enjoying that. I'm really excited to see that a lot of you are able to have a, a bottle of Shiraz with you. Um, obviously, most people have got the 2016, so yes. that is fantastic. Um, but there are a couple of lucky devils with the 09 out there. Um, so, yeah. We heard from a friend over in Switzerland who had a 2008 Reserve Shiraz. So we're yeah, sending cheers to him and hope he's enjoying it. Jan? That's right. yes. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Darren's asked whether we pinch a few bunches of Shiraz from Carl. Um, no, we, <laughs> that would be Carl Lancaster at yes. Lancaster Wines. We don't actually buy any All Shiraz right. fruit in um, normally. The only year was that 2017. Uh, and it was not from Lancaster, it was actually from uh, the foothills. So just, uh, we're in the Swan Valley and as the... Uh, There's a uh, chittering, doesn't it? No, 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 it's, it's actually at the end of Hadrill Road. Oh. So it's just literally, if you put your back to the river and you look straight to the hills, the vineyard that we bought them from is, is, oh, is just up there. So it's just as it starts going up the slope um, and the soil's pretty gravelly where we bought it from. Amazing. Uh, what else have we got? I'm loving these questions. This is always my favourite part of every live stream. We've got some people saying uh, the 2016 is very smooth. It goes down a bit too easily. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I feel the yes. pain. Okay, we've got a wine suggestion from Daniel. Oh. Emu and kangaroo would go well. Yes, because as we mentioned with the venison, that gamey kind of character, that nice sort of irony note to them. I think with aged, aged Shiraz is definitely with anything quite gamey and yeah. Um, nice we've rich. also got here, um, <laughs> um, uh, Sarah's teaming it with uh, some beautiful chocolate. Is that wrong? Never. No, Never I ever. No. I think that's great. And I think those chocolatey notes on the finish that you get from the oak really will help, you know, yeah. works well It'll with the chocolate. It'll accentuate the kind of, yeah, and like when you actually have chocolate with wine, the fruit character in the wine comes through a bit more. You detect it more on your taste buds, so that's quite an interesting thing. I hope you're enjoying it. Um, can, Kim said, can you tell us how you manage the grape on the vine to ensure a quality taste when it's in the bottle? Well, that is the key, isn't it? That is um, really the key. I think that's the million dollar question there, Kim. Sorry, I have to move in yeah. now to uh, read the questions. Um, that's a really long question, and I guess as Stephen was saying just before, it is really a bit of a quality quantity trade off. Um, so you need to uh, restrict the yield so that you get those lovely intense fruit flavours. Um, I guess the example I use that I hope makes some sense. Um, if you imagine a vine, it has only so many roots, if it's got to share all that. Um, energy and the food and the you know, stuff that's nutrients, that nutrients kind of thing, yeah. that it's getting from the soil um, amongst, let's go with 50 bunches of grapes, they're going to all get a bit and they will be plump and juicy and they will look great because we, we irrigate here so we would um, make sure that they had enough uh, water. But then if you imagine all those nutrients are just shared amongst 30 bunches of grapes, they're going to get a lot more and that basically is going to turn into flavour. So that's the key with that quality quantity trade-off. Um, is, is, is not overloading the vine. And then if you have a hundred bunch of grapes, they're gonna taste like water. Yeah. So I guess that's the thing. Uh, the, the other challenges about growing the grapes would be obviously managing pests and diseases. It's really, it's a whole year, it's a cycle. Um, 
And you'd be surprised by how long it took me to realise. Like, oh gosh, it's pruning again. Oh goodness me, it's vintage again. And it's like, oh that's right, we run a seasonal business. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be mine. That's it. That's the season. Um, so yeah, so it is a seasonal thing. And I think uh, on the website there is a, uh, a year and upper reach. So I go through there um, what we're doing each part of the year. And really, um, uh, Derek's not here, so we can say this. He's kind of anal retentive about grape growing. Um, <laughs> that is his real passion. Um, he strongly believes that wine is made in the vineyard. So he's managing yields, uh, which is that quality quality trade off. He's making sure that the um, no pests and diseases, that's obviously a given. Um, he's also uh, managing the canopy, which is basically the leaf matter that you see yeah. growing. Uh, it's all coming off at the moment, so we've got leaves everywhere, it being autumn. But for example, Lots in spring, sweet, yeah. Uh, in spring you can see the vines start to grow almost in front of your eyes. It's like yes. this much on Tuesday and by Thursday it's sort of this high and then the next week it's that high. So um, yeah, it's a, um, it, and also then with the irrigation and any nutrients or fertilizers. So I mean that's kind of the art of grape growing is, is making <laughs> grapes that make nice wine. And then um, Derek would say, because his philosophy as I said is very much that the wine is grown in the vineyard, you just don't mess it up in the winery. Yeah. You know, don't mess it up. Uh, having said that, make sure your filament goes through so you don't have sweet red wine. Um, <laughs> and your barrel awesome. management as well. Uh, so yeah, so how, you're, how, how you manage the oak. So you want to make sure that your oak is not overpowering um, the fruit. Uh, so you've got your fruit and your oak in balance. And I mean, I think someone said that, they said, oh, that they were thinking that the 2016 was looking really well integrated. So thank you for that. That's um, part of his job. <laughs> Oh, and Chris as well. So you have the 2008 Shiraz. So he has a bottle in his rack. So cool. do you reckon he should? Oh, well, it's up to you. Um, look, there's no tearing urgency. Uh, if you had a bottle of 2003, I'd say yes, open it. Maybe not today. Make sure you've got the right food and then, um, you know, open that. But 2008, there's no tearing hurry. Uh, we've sold all of that. So we, we hold back a wine to release when we think it's drinking really beautifully. Um, if I still had 2008, I would be happy with that, but we have sold that. Having said that, 2008 wasn't such a big year as 2009. Now, see, the brain works a bit slow. Um, so, yeah, look, anytime this winter, anytime next winter, but it won't last forever, it's not magic. Um, you know, I do have quite a few people come to Centre and they're like, oh, I want to buy a wine that's gonna last, that is gonna be brilliant when my kid is 30. It's like, mm. I'm not sure I'm going to give you those guarantees. Um, so, yeah, yeah, 2008, this year, next year, the year after, but probably I'd say within the next three years. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. And we've got one other question as well. So just an inquiry, with the 2020 that we tasted, when do we think that's going to go on sale? <laughs> it's a tough one. Yeah, I mean, well, we're skipping uh, a vintage. A long time yeah. is the short answer. It's going to be in barrel for 18 months. So it's not even going to get bottled till this time Oh, next year, well, 18 months, you know, plus a bit. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it won't even be bottled. And then we age it. For example, we released 2016 um, this Christmas, so that was uh, three years on, wasn't it? Because of Christmas 19, uh, 2019. Um, that's when we released it. Um, and it was picked uh, January, you know, well, probably not really January, it was February, March, March probably uh, in 2009, uh, sorry, 2016. So that's three and a half years, so I guess similar. Um, we may be a little bit quicker uh, because we have got that year that we've missed the vintage. Um, and, and, and we had to sort of, we knew that happened, so we've, you know, that was not new news, so we've certainly been trying to, um, uh, if, we, if we had the option to make a bit more in the subsequent vintages, then we did. Um, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> It's all exciting. I mean, if you get the chance, once we're all back open and up and running again and doing tastings, I urge you to come out. I mean, we are normally open seven days a week for tastings. I mean, especially if you come and see when I'm tasting wine, I'm always going to have that Shiraz open, but I don't normally tell Laura that. So come on out and enjoy. Um, as well, Mother's Day coming up too, guys. So um, we do have some great hampers that are available online if you really want to get um, mum something special. Something nice to send them yeah. because I think now we can go and see our parents but you know it's been a, a while and I know um, you know especially if your parents are a bit older um, it's, it's, it is hard on them so something that you can get delivered yeah. is always a good thing so yeah. 
<laughs> but we can we can mix it up. We'll do whatever you want. If you want to pick and choose a few different things, put some wine in, put some chocolates and honeys, whatever. You know, just something. Yeah, just show you. It'll be a nice little care package as well. Um, and we've also just created a food recipe sharing blog as well. So please, if you have any great recipes that you've been matching wines to, um, we would love to hear from you. Um, you can either put them in the comments below, or if you'd like to email us with the recipes, we would greatly appreciate it. We find that we're cooking so much more in this situation, so it's just more sharing ideas, getting some inspiration, and trying new things in the kitchen as well. Um, it's been yeah. fun actually. I've really enjoyed Cellar Door over these sort of um, bizarre times. Um, everyone's really happy to chat and to share what they're doing and that sort of thing. And um, you know, I think I was talking about making bread. You know, how weird is that? You can normally go and buy bread. But actually, I've really enjoyed doing it. But then people were saying, oh yeah, and I've been enjoying doing this and that. And so we just started, we just started getting all these wonderful ideas. Like I know that the, um, Jeremy gave us the dark and um, uh, yeah, there's a few different ones where I was like, you know what, let's put these up, let's really make a proper sharing blog. Now, we're not that technologically advanced, so you can't upload yourself. We haven't created our own Facebook. Uh, if we let you put them up, then all the robots will get in and put things that nobody really wants to know about. Exactly. So just email us your recipes and we'll share them with you because, you know, it's always fun. And you guys have had so many great ideas over these last few weeks about um, different food uh, to match with the various wines. It's fantastic. Exactly. And, um yeah, like pretty much guys, if you want to come out for a nice little stroll around the vineyard or a picnic, I know Monday's a bit of a write-off weather-wise, but throughout the week we would love to see you come out here and enjoy yourself. Yeah, and um, we don't, people have been asking today, you know, what's happening, what are you doing next week? It's Mother's Day, it's like, yeah, we have no idea. Um, things have changed so quickly, um, I don't think anybody knows, I don't know what the weather's like, but we will be here, we'll have wine for you to um, buy. If it's a nice picnic day and the restaurant's not open, um, you're very welcome to do that. But um, yeah, thank you everyone for all your support. It's been so lovely doing these, it's been really fun. That's been great fun. Well, cheers Laura and cheers to you guys as well. And we will see you next week for our sparkling wine tasting. Yeah, great. Oh, and after that, the week after that, we've got the um, fortifiers as well, which will be lovely. So be hopefully that will be a cold, wintry sort of day. Exactly. Looking forward to it. Cheers, guys. Thank see you, you very much. Week. Really great <laughs> to see you. Bye. <laughs> the awkward walk out. <laughs> <laughs> Cheerio.